Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Jeremy Donovan, who is currently the SVP of Sales Strategy and Operations at Salesloft. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I'm super excited about this episode because Jeremy has well, a wealth of experience, but in also uh, a breadth of commercial fields. So we have marketing, we have strategy, and we have sales. Um, and the other thing I'm excited about is because Jeremy works at Salesloft, who, if, if people don't know listening, uh, create software for salespeople. And so the person who is leading sales strategy at a company that does software for salespeople, I'm, I'm thinking is going to be on the cutting edge and it's going to have some great in, insights for us. Jeremy, am I, am I right about that? Hopefully, hopefully I will. I, I guess the breadth of experience equates to being old. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for putting it so nicely. Um, so let's kick it off. Um, as I mentioned, you, 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 you've been in different areas in the commercial space. At what point did you first move into sales operations? It was, I, yeah, much later in my career, actually. So I, I started my career as a, actually as a semiconductor engineer way, way back. And I moved progressively through the world of being a technology industry analyst into product, into marketing. And I think it's only been about a decade or so, um, which I guess sounds like a long time. But uh, so about 10 years ago, I moved into, into sales strategy, sales operations, and, and uh, um, I was a CRO briefly as well. Uh, and so the question here is, why did you make that that shift? Yeah, great question. Uh, it's a rare that anyone asks me that. I, I appreciate that you did. Um, it, what the, the I think sort of the, the way I've intentionally, unintentionally managed my career is I have ended up pursuing areas where analytics and the engineering that I learned and continue to try to pick up in computer science and so on when I was younger, I can then apply. So that, that is what drew me to marketing originally when marketing, you know, 15 plus years ago was being transformed from purely the creative brand sort of marketing over to the hyper analytical um, uh, like demand gen based marketing in the B2B world that drew me into marketing. And then similarly, sales has been undergoing that transformation for years uh, and it's still, I think we still have a ways to go, which means it's, it's really exciting to solve different problems. I, I think there's an incredible kind of analytical problems to solve in forecasting, for example, in territory assignment, in um, uh, account scoring. So there's still inc- like these, this incredible frontier of analytical problems to solve in sales. Got it. And I've definitely had that almost since the start of these interviews. I've had people say the importance of the analytical, mathematical, scientific side of sales ops. And so it kind of makes sense, right? Because you have that engineering background from, from way back, not from way back, from, from before. And so it does kind of make sense to me that you gravitated towards this more analytical field as opposed to doing like the creative brand stuff that you may have been doing before in marketing. Yeah, that, that one would have. I certainly was not doing the brand and creative piece. I came in when uh, it, there was a particular situation where the company I was at had a, 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 a CMO who had come up through the brand world. And the CEO at the time was frustrated that um, we were not able to to say how what to basically do the attribution right we weren't able to say how much of that you know million tens of millions of dollars of spend actually was dedicated uh you know was actually returning so that's when i moved into that uh into that role got it cool um so fast forward to today sales loft uh, roughly how many reps are you guys supporting and what's the size of the sales loft team yeah, it's it's always like how many reps is always complicated because whether or not you include the uh, certainly SDRs, account executives, account managers, uh, depends on whether you include customer success and retention people. But all told, it's somewhere between 100 and 150, depending on how you measure things. And then we have we have uh, I mean, like many companies, we have a decentralized revenue operations organization. So within sales ops, we're about five people. Uh, but then if you were to include sort of the uh, the diaspora of revenue operations with marketing ops people, customer success ops people, systems, business systems people, it's probably about 10 total. So, it's, so I guess that's roughly about a, like a 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 ratio. That is the sweet spot I found, 15 to 1. Um, and then quickly, the, uh, the sales tech stack you guys are running. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. We, we, we you know, we do audits from t- periodically and we have so much sales technology. Uh, but I, if I were to kind of go through the, 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 uh, you know, prospecting through, through account, uh, op- opportunities and so on. So, uh, we're obviously using LinkedIn sales navigator, probably like most of the rest of the world. Uh, we use zoom info as well for our contact data. And we have used different providers over time. We're also big on intent data right now. So we have a bunch of intent data sources, uh, demand based terminus and G2. So those are uh, three intent, uh, kind of base data providers in the UK and Europe. We use Cognizum for our uh, contact data. We supplement zoom info with Cognizum. And then, of course, we, we drink our own champagne, so we use sales law for sales engagement that ties into Salesforce. Um, and then you know, we like bits and pieces of lots of other um, different technologies. Uh, some of the more, I guess, interesting ones are things that we use for direct mail, which is having a, a bit of a resurgence. Uh, uh, and we use two things for that. We use Sendoso, which we're super happy with, and we also use Alice, A-L-Y-C-E. So that's just a, a taste of uh, dozens and dozens of, of, of sales and marketing tech that we use in our stack. Got it. And are you, are you feeding in that direct mail piece into the SDR cadence so someone may get a use that hello? Yeah, we do, both for uh, SDRs and for AEs. So uh, they have a certain budget that they can use each month on both of those platforms, Sendoso and Alice. Sendoso tends to, we, we, we'll do um, more like coffee cards and that kind of thing, like low, lower end uh, gifts via Sendoso, sort of the quick thing to get people's attention. And then we'll typically use Alice more for, uh, you know, a highly qualified prospect and, and we're thanking them maybe after they do the, the first meeting. Uh, so it's more of a thank you as opposed to a get to know you. And then in, uh, I didn't even mention, I don't know if we executed through Alice or through, through something else, but uh, for certain prospects, you know, we'll go further that we're like most organizations where it's charitable uh forward organization so for for in certain circumstances we'll make donations on behalf of the individual to uh to charity so that's another kind of vehicle that we uh that we use to it it you know it does good and helps out the sales cycle at the same time got it and because you use the word budget monthly budget are those tools kind of decentralized and you give the salesperson the budget and they use it where they see fit you're not saying you have to send this person something at this point so in our cadence, it is a step in the cadence. So absolutely, they do get to choose uh, whether or not because their budget may, you know, may have been exhausted. So they may have to skip that step in the cadence. So there's a, a degree of centralization uh, to it because they don't have an unlimited budget to do it. But there is here is where we recommend you do this within the cadence. Got it. Any, so I assume you guys have gone more remote over the past few weeks any oh, yeah. <laughs> has anything what have you guys had to do as a sales ops team to ensure the productivity of the reps um interestingly it, it was relatively smooth for us I, I was commenting to another sales ops leader i was talking to yesterday about how much more that uh, it's one of the um it's his head of sales ops over at bill.com and we were commenting on how much more email and how many more phone calls we're getting right now and I think it's a function of, you know, people have saved all these hours in their commute and, and there's been a blurring of the line between work life and, and home life, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess. We, you know, everybody needs that, needs that separation and the break. Um, so we have not, from a sales tech uh, and operations and enablement point of view, there, there really has not been a huge change for us. Um, you know, I, I don't want to oversell. I don't want to sell at all from the, you know, from the stage as it were. Um, but the fact that people were already using sales loft meant like they had prospects in cadence already. So it wasn't a huge adjustment for them. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Got it. And have you had to tweak your forecast or what you're expecting to achieve over this year or next year? Has anything changed? 
Yeah, that was the other thing I, I've been talking to my peers about. I think that is that's you know after the, the I think your first question about uh, adjustments for remote working is usually the first question. The second question is how has the forecast changed? It's uh, probably the most common thing I, I hear and I, I talk about with with everybody I meet. Uh, yeah, absolutely, we've had to change our. We've had well. The forecast has been updating, so we actually. I mean, we're pretty sophisticated uh, in the way we do forecast modeling. That you know, you know, we do this the typical data collection that everyone does, right? With with uh, stage weighted pipeline and and uh, forecast category, right? Your best case pipeline commit sort of thing. But we layer on top of that a bit of data science, so that at any day in a month or any day in a quarter. Uh, we have multiple models that are predicting where we will end for that period, and they're they're statistical. Uh, they're, they're statistical models. So uh, I think the, the it's not that we had to change the 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 uh, underlying models, but the models have been outputting you know very different answers at, in real time as the COVID uh, pandemic has evolved. So um, yeah. Since you've been at Salesloft, and I'm putting you on the spot here, Jeremy, what's the one thing that you've done which has had the biggest impact on rep productivity? Uh, I, th- I would say the biggest thing we've done in sales ops that has had an impact on productivity is, is account scoring, and, and, and that relates into territory assignment. That our, our reps, like all reps, would go through a tremendous amount of data, um, right, industry size, tech stack, um, opportunity history, on and on and on, right? Factor after factor after factor, intent data, all of this stuff, right? So many signals that they were trying to find, you know, to, to or so much noise that they were trying to extract the signal out of. So uh, another kind of statistical uh, thing that we did was we, we created a, a, uh, an algorithm that uses all of those firmographic intent um, activity, uh, all that, like with, there's probably now 10 or 15 factors that are inside that model. So that model actually gives us a, an account score. So now reps don't have to spend all that time going through all that information. At first they, you know, they were wary of it because they still wanted to do their same thing and they had to ride the change management curve. But once they found, and that takes a good, you know, three to six months, but once they found that, Hey, these accounts that I would find are good, this particular score, we uh, one of our one of my colleagues named it uh, the Cerebra score. Uh, so, uh, what, once now when they look at the Cerebra score, they, they they trust that score, so that saves them a tremendous amount of time in identifying accounts. Yeah. So there's whenever they're introducing this kind of scoring, there's almost the gray period of trust or no trust, where you're the rest are like, oh, not sure. But then once it clicks, and they c- can forget about whether the numbers accurate or not then that's where you see the the driving productivity yeah yeah and i think everything it it relates to every every change i probably it's a human thing but particularly in sales operations right is like salespeople are you know they're like humans are risk averse when it comes to to changing what they're doing right that they get so they build their habits and so on and and they really do look to um they look to their peers to see who's maybe at the bleeding edge and successful, or they, you know, they'll check things a million times until they, until they uh, believe it. It relates, it just it's related tangent, I guess, but it relates to when I was in marketing, uh, you know, we would send over leads and we'd have to be really, really careful that if we started a new lead source, that the leads that were flowing over were like the best leads, because if they got one bad lead from that new lead source, they would throw the, the whole lead source out and, and assume that all of them were bad. So yeah, you got to be really delicate with, with these things. That's hilarious, isn't it? They're like, <laughs> as soon as the sales person sees this, this crazy new thing, which might not be good, they're like, nope, never, I can't. Those leads yeah. are rubbish. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on to metrics then. Um, if you could only measure one sales-related metric for the rest of your sales ops career, which would you choose? Can I do one metric by role or it has to be one metric to end all metrics? I think it would have to be one to end all. Um, I, I would say it would be, you know, there's, uh, I'm a big fan of, of Jason Jordan and Michelle Vazen. I can't really get her name wrong. Vazena, I think. Uh, and they, they wrote a couple books 
called Cracking the Sales Management Code. And then there was another one, I think, called Crushing Quota after that one. And they talk about this progression from activity to results with this intermediate stage. And they have a different name for it, but I just call it effectiveness. So I, I would measure an, an effectiveness metric. And if it were if it were prospecting centric, because I think you, you know, if you don't fill the top of the funnel, then then the rest is not gonna not gonna happen. So the measure I actually look at is is uh, the number of ops created per activity. I think that like that effectiveness measure to me is is probably the one I would measure. Cool. So you're basically measuring whether the like whether the rep is good at their job. Yeah, that's it. Like, I mean, if I just measured activity, it might be bad activity, right? Um, I, and results is a lagging indicator. So I can't, if I, if I'm just measuring results, I can't actually do anything about it. So I, I love that intermediate thing, which is, Hey, you know, you're spending 50% more activity than your colleague in order to get an opportunity. Here's what they're doing. So if you do these things, you can be much more efficient. So I, I really love those kind of efficiency or productivity or effectiveness ratings. Got it. And then obviously over time, once you're giving that rep who's not so good, the, the tips or the strategies from the other one, you, you're going to want to see those effectiveness me, uh, metrics. Increase. Yeah. And I, I mean, I used to work for, uh, at one point in my career, I spent a, a span of about a year, eight years working for former McKinsey partners and, and senior uh, associates. And that's one of the sort of hallmarks of McKinsey is around business optimization is that you find these bright spots, you find these people in, in any in any population of of you know people business or or in a social context, there's always like even if things are going poorly, there's always some bright spot in there where things are going well. So uh, ditto with reps, right? Is you can always segment your reps into whatever top ten percent, middle eighty, bottom ten, and you know I think, I think the key to to having a successful impactful sales operations organization is that you you're, you're sniffing constantly to understand who the top 10% is in any particular metric, understand what behaviors they are exhibiting that, that the, you know, the other 90% are not, and then go teach and then go teach them uh, how to, how to do that. And then obviously uh, inspect and expect uh, in, in order to get the change. Got it. And then final question, who has inspired or educated you the most in sales operations? Oh, wow. Um, I feel, I, I mean, it's a, sort of a cop out of an answer, but it's, it's no, it's no one person. Um, I'm, I'm really fortunate like you to do webinars and podcasts and that sort of thing. So uh, I host a podcast and on that podcast, you know, I've now had, uh, something like 120 probably guests. And as people ask me, who's my favorite guest? And I, I say, I, like all of them, which again, sounds like a cop on answer, but it's, it's, I learn something from everyone I talk to. And I, I think that's, you know, that's a bit of my cop out answer. It's like the same thing. I got my, I got my PC, uh, PC stacked up on a pile of books so that the camera is about eye level right now. And the ditto is like, I, I, it's, I've almost never read a book that I didn't get something valuable or provocative or thoughtful of. And as long as I get one, you know, most sales books are whatever, 200, 250 pages. Uh, as long as I get one nugget, even just one new provocative thing to think about, um, you know, I'm happy about that. I just read, um, I just read a, a, like a very small book. I think it's like a hundred page book by uh, George Bronton. And uh, I'm actually going to be having him on my on my podcast in a little while. So I always read people's books cover to cover. And he makes some very provocative statements, for example, about the application of AI in um, sales and sales operations. So even those provocative statements, even though the rest of the book is the things that I was familiar with, like, and, and yes, I'm familiar with that. It just got me thinking, you know, is like, what is the role of AI in complex B2B sales? So again, long, long-winded answer, but no one... No one resource, but an infinite uh, army of resources that that educate me every day. Got it. Um, just before I finish off, the name of the podcast so the listeners can go and check it out. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's called Hey Salespeople. And 
Yeah, they can find it on uh, yeah all the usual all the usual sources. And then I also I, I invite I'm pretty open about LinkedIn. So if you're a real human being, you know, with a real photo and a real bio, uh, please connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. And then I every day I drop one sentence basically that I have learned from someone else. So from a book or podcast or a conversation with somebody and it reflects kind of what I want to consume on LinkedIn, which is uh, I don't want self-promotional stuff. I want actionable, immediately actionable data-driven stuff on sales. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I, that's like what I try to do is, is create what I would want to read. Sure. Amazing. So a learning from everyone, that's the first one. But the one thing that I think is super important for the audience is your point about business optimization. And however, let's say you join a new company as running sales ops and things are not going that well, there'll be some segment, some one rep maybe who's doing something well. And so you're, you're, you're sniffing, as the word you, you used, to then go find that and then take it to the other reps and ideally measuring that somehow. That's the thing that I think that everybody listening can potentially benefit from. And the second small one was if you, when you roll something new out, like a new lead source, uh, try and manage the process so you, you do build the trust with the rest so they do actually use it and benefit from that. Yeah. So I'd add one thing to that, by the way, which is so critical, um, or maybe the sort of on the change thing. One is you absolutely need CRO level support. Um, two is... Yes, enablement is critical for training, but uh, the third thing, which is probably the most important, is that I, I learned in the course of my career, if if your sales managers don't drive the change and believe in the change, it will not happen. So your first line sales managers are the are like the critical uh, catalyst for change. You c- cannot skip that step. Train them first. Awesome. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom.